very much for such a charming reception. I hope you feel the same at the end. <laughs> well, I'm here tonight just to read a few poems and how the poems came into existence is largely because when I was uh, very young and off, after the war my family emigrated to New York and it was such an exciting experience as a ten-year-old to be living in New York and then we joined our family in the Bronx which is the kind of like the East End partly of New York went to school there I stayed with my uncle Joe and I can always remember a big old rooming house and we used to climb the stairs to the attic where they put my whole family up in the attic it wasn't terribly salubrious but for my family it was a bit of a strain it was stressful they hoped they could improve things but it was just after the war and for many people in New York, they, even they couldn't find work, they didn't have somewhere to live. That was certainly uh, up to the standards that most people would like. But for me, as a ten-year-old, to me, the place was astonishing. It was unbelievable. Because I had learned about America through the comics that my cousin used to send me. You know, Captain Marvel, Superman, and Batman. And I started to imagine that Superman actually lived somewhere in New York. I would see him flying over the buildings. And so, that's just a brief introduction of how much it meant to me. And I, I can tell you, and you probably had similar experiences, all of you, of some amazing trip, that when you're 10 and you're on the Queen Elizabeth I, and the boat docks in New York and they, I think, plan it so that you, you dock at, at dawn and they see the lights of Manhattan looming up in front of you. And such an image, when you're ten and you've come from a little country town where we were evacuated and you get on the deck, it's October, it's cool, you see these buildings looming up in front of you and you think this is exactly, exactly as I expected. This is exactly like Batman, exactly I almost expect. Where is Captain Marvel? I'm going to see him any minute. And this sight I could never ever forget. But to finish this small introduction, my family found it too difficult. I found it fascinating going to school. I was in PS70 in the Bronx. I was becoming an American. My cousin brought me my first pair of long pants. I was amazed because I had been wearing little, these horrible little short pants <laughs> to feel the cloth over my knees. <laughs> it was an, an amazing emancipation. <laughs> and so I was thrilled every single second but they came back because they couldn't get a decent place to live, Dad couldn't find a job, but I had been contaminated by America. I had the germ that was somehow sowed inside me. It had been plunged deep into my DNA, into my bloodstream. I dreamed about it. I fantasized about it. I thought, when are we going back? I felt myself to be somehow torn between there and here. And I remember we came back one horrible winter on the Queen Mary this time <clears throat> to Southampton. And I recall how utterly depressing <laughs> Southampton <laughs> and these low, grubby little buildings after Manhattan. It was horrific. And I went into almost a catatonic state. <laughs> I couldn't believe the horror. Oh, the horror, the horror. And then we had lost our little house because we had immigrated. So we were forced to return to our family's original place 
in the east end of London in Stepney, but there was no room at the inn. So we stayed with my Uncle Sam in Cannon Street Road, just a room. And I went to school, to Christian Street School, and I turned up for the first day. The teachers welcomed me, and I wore a double-breasted suit with long pants. <laughs> and the kids looked and went, ah! <laughs> They'd never seen anything like it. And they gave me a nickname. They called me, they thought, called me Spit. It was a stupid name. So I came back to America. And I came back, and I still had that same sensation of wonderment. As I came back, this time we flew. And I flew into New York. And then, at that time, got the train from the airport to Central Grand Central Station. And then was told you get a cheap hotel down on Lower East or in um, <coughs> West 12th Street where I stayed. So I never lost the absolute fascination with America. And it took hold of me. And I never really got over it. And so these are just a few poems reflecting that. So this is New York. <coughs> When I came back eventually, my late, early, late 20s, early 30s, okay. So I just walking through the streets, I found so interesting, so stimulating. I was so curious, I felt somehow like a ghost. I was watching. I thought, what do these people do sitting in diners, walking down the street, in cafes, in bars? I don't know them. What do they do? What's their life? So I felt I was always watching. I slid into Manhattan day when dawn began to shave the night and creatures hid in coffee shops as blue covered the world in light. A cold, stark, steely blue stretched out bright canvas against the fire escapes. The yellow sign of Hudson Street, the green one points the other way. I picked up from the faces, from the sounds. I gulped down life like one who's starved and bends his legs to pick up butts, eyes hungry to be spared apart. I look, I stare. My eyes are mouths, my ears are stomachs, can't get enough. I've been too long, too long starved for the ferocity of life and heart. I leap like tethered starving cat will eat the lowest grimy scraps. I'd suck the air from a dying corpse if it would give my lost life back. It is as if, as if, like lost, like dead perhaps, outside a ghost, watching the bodies just steal the meat, while I, meatless, just contemplate. Now I know, I know, I didn't, didn't I walk a thousand times Sixth Avenue and try to eat the past I missed by shoving bagels in my fist? Didn't I, yes, didn't I, with bulging eyes that clawed the skies, Bite the Chrysler in half, grabbed Hershey bars, and once, yes, once in a bar I laughed. I did, yes, like I do. I dipped my toe into the ocean's brew, then waited for the sharks to bite, and then ran back to the Hover's types. This island breathes like in one sigh, or like some endless symphony. I, yes again, the eye says, throw the drum my way, I'll keep the beat. Of course, of course, the local store sells everything you need, the lot, the coffee pot is always on, the soup is hot, the bagels fresh, the coffee beans, the delicatess. Of course, of course, it's rich, it flows, it grows, it goes on, it explodes, it never says no's like the England's favorite sound. Here, the yeses other streets background. Sunday, yes. It's bright, cold, steely blue. The plumbing barked all night and spewed like old throats dying their last gasp or intestines choked with old farts. 
You know, I bet she fucks up, says the beast, whose mouth is foul as dragon's breath. At 8.30 a.m., she wants raw clams and wears a dirty see-through vest. What are they doing here at 8, fouling the morning's crisp new hair? Like dragging from the night their filth and coated teeth and matted hair, their New York stomachs, goblins, homes that ever filled regorge as if the world was just a smorgasbord they grabbed with two fat, oily fists. Beneath their raw rip sound, their torn out cords make thick from shouting out daily demands French fries, too early, dear. Oh, shit. Who are these people? Who and where, from whence and how? So vast and loud, such violence in their needing sound. I hear the New York underground. I hear greed whipped into a song. Their plumbing spraying strings of phlegm, their fat lips trebling out the wrong of the world they think has done to them. If a dancer wants to fuck the shit out of a customer, it's her business. Ah, now the clues come streaming through. From whence these animals come, what zoo? They live to earn a buck from sex, their wombs as dead as coffin lids. Their words streamlined in hate and shit. The word that all occasions fit. Excited I was. Walking down Third Avenue from Gramercy Hotel. You see, years ago, the Gramercy was a kind of a very, very ordinary hotel, a bit of a dump, but a lot of people liked it there because it had a wonderful bar. And all, a lot of rock and rollers used to go to the bar. And, you know, at 5 o'clock, they have this kind of, um, you know, easy hour where they served up little bits of food that was kind of great fun but then one of those great hoteliers brought it up and changed it but before then it was known as a no frills hotel it had great rooms big large double rooms with a king size bed and probably some of you may have known the Gramercy Hotel in the old days and I had a, a lovely big room but the kitchen area kitchenette was a bit disgusting, a bit filthy, with a small gas ring and a shelf. But there was no saucepan on the shelf, so I couldn't make my tea. So I went downstairs to the man who was the, uh, the manager, and I knocked on the door, and I said, excuse me, in my best English tone, I have a room upstairs, but uh, do you have any spare saucepans? He says, if you come here, you have to bring your own saucepans. This is a no-frills hotel. <laughs> so that's when I understood that expression. The no-frills hotel. But then it was bought up by one of these people like Sanderson's, and they've changed it, reordered it, refurbished it, reconstructed it, and it's horrible. <laughs> and I went back there just to try it, and cab stopped, 23rd Street, Went in, beautiful big foyer, but a little bit dark. I found my way to the reception area. <coughs> I said, good evening, because it's actually afternoon. It's not like it's good evening. <laughs> I said, I have a room here. Oh, yeah, what's your name? I said, Burkham. You have a credit card? <laughs> and I, I thought, what a way to greet anybody. I never, but this was the time when it was still the No Frills Hotel. Well, excited, excited I was walking down Third Avenue from Gramercy Hotel. The air caressed the lazy crowd that strolled through Saturday's easy swell. The sun delivered hot, then cool, as frothy winds whipped up the clouds, a background washed in gouache blue, and diamonds spat down from high towers. The sun shot thick, bright yellow streams and sparks flew from the clash of light, hurtling itself against the braided seams of Christless fluted satellite. That mighty, massive, silver giant, sheer, heavy steel 
poised like to burst from launching pad into the pliant sky, ripping its roots from out the earth. So there we sat, myself and I, in ancient automat on 42. In those days, they had a thing called the automat. It was like a completely self-service, um, very uh, functional, metallic kind of restaurant where there were no staff, but they had lots of little metal boxes. And you put 25 cents or 50 cents or a dollar, and you take out a sandwich or a soup or whatever you want. It's called the automat. They no longer exist. So there we sat, myself and I, an ancient automat on 42, an Englishman or Ulysses, and cakes appeared in little cubes. And men with sallow faces sat like lonely people seeking space of cafeterias, maybe to crack the nut of silence of their empty place. Oh yes, automatic automat, whose safe deposit boxes show the goodies behind glass, the fat fruit-stuffed cakes topped with snow, the slots whose mouths have sucked the change from billion sweaty hands, a billion quarters drown their gut, a sea of coffee drown the land. Out of the great window I stared at Christless demons in frozen steel perched on edges, obelisks to scare the devils and the deeming swill. Damn streets! Damned carnage pouring, but today the Saturday is silk, swept with cut pineapples on corners and 75 cents to eat your fill. I wandered, stretching tens and out, pump feed, pound and eat the dust, hurl the photos of the past and shout, Hallelujah! Now I wish to crush the city to me. Take it through my veins and melt in the stream and wrap my skin around you and weave you in my dreams. Oh, America was for me an utter supreme fantasy when I was still with sticky hands unfolding the wonders of Batman, the comics thick and glossy smells, the heavy post from US aunts to small and British suburban hell. A child absorbed the stride and blast of Superman and wicked, vicious men. Wax sack a splat above the skies and Gotham City silhouettes and thoughts in curvy bubbles rise. So now, yes, yes, this is no dream, but columns glide up tall, serene, majestic, thousand-eyed monolith, taut tension, gurgled, girdled in steel mesh. Below the 19th century, Crumbles, slow, a stack of ancient houses crouch beneath the steely towers, humbled low, waiting for the ball of iron's punch. And yet their ancient memories contrast so well, a spell of memory heat blasted years that paint upon the face its gnarled history. Below dry clean as express served, and dinner for your every whim, a transient and cheap hotel and bookshop specializing in skin, and on and yet on I walked, like a child taking his first weak steps, head leaning back on spinal cord to drink in dizzying perspectives. A tramp stood still, beard grizzled white, thick slashed coat hung like shaggy mane, an animal in perplexed flight, caught in crossroads. Don't walk, it says. He stumbles on. Why, etched in pain, past sunglasses made for the rich, an agony inside his brain. Oh, two hundred dollars, oh, they suit you, miss. And now the mouth of subways, dark inferno in the ground, blinking as one leaves the rumbling sound of hell that churns the night away. The long intestines soured and grim, carrying the blood of the city's life in twisting lines of veins within, in flesh-crushed spirit, worn in strife. Pick up the daily news today. Let's see who's slain, whose bloody corpse will grace the tabloid front page. Oh, some rival gang sprayed death to poor innocent bystander who caught the slug. The freedom bullet, frontier land. Let's all have guns, you mugs. It makes you feel the more the man. Let's look at the type. Slay, 
Anger, cops, shootout, fatal mugger, rival gang, leader conflict, stray gunshot. A kid dies holding his mother's hand. An eight-year-old whose innocence was smashed by men who made the slugs, whose bellies swell with bloody scents, and fat wives who practice yoga on the rug. The counter hand, his dishes clawed, his, his one arm piled, his, piled up plates like magician making sleight of hand, toasted cheese and salad taste great. He wears a uniform, black pants, white shirt, a counter hand, he stalks the aisle, hunting down orders, pencil alert, mashed potatoes, he ash, a french fries. I walk the blazing, sun-drenched streets, love the ubiquitous and heavy air from Gramercy Hotel, I felt the heat blast down 3rd Avenue as I repaired to morning coffee, open sheets of news blast. What's the treat? Stare dumbly, absorb shockwaves, death reeked a field day, chopped off ripe years. Truck driver killed simply by chance. As irate citizen, hating cops, sprays from sawn off, makes his dance of death outside the cop house. Poor Tom is snuffed. A 25-year-old truckie who stopped to ask directions, fated time, he found no need since time had stopped and armaments work overtime. Oh, more coffee, please. Let's turn the page. Cold-hearted tourists watched and laughed as Harry died from Empire State. 86 floors, then splits in half. <laughs> By impact, said the police. They know they shoveled up the human meat. There was a name of Harry Larkin, so his mother once named the once whole piece. So once again, the greatest monolith, the King Kong of Manhattan's beast, as stands cold waiting for the breath of victims sucked out in fatal leaps. He was the number 29 to sacrifice for Empire State. Brilliant and stately, concrete and wires, sucked in its guts 10,000 slaves. And chewing up their sweat and gall, its great big mouth to swallow all, then as the sun goes west in lazy crawl, it spits them from its bloated crawl. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're too kind. Thanks very much. Oh, you're too kind. I'm very encouraged. Thank you. Thank you. I was very uncertain of this. <coughs> Another thing in the paper. <coughs> I've got a Bronx school teacher shot and crossfire between two drug dealers. A Bronx school teacher bites the dust. At 53, she lived alone. A parakeet, her solitary pal. She chats to him and cleans his cage then works at public school 53. There she unfurls the mysteries that lurk in Shakespeare's braided verse. Audrey Chasen is her name, not too pretentious, not too bold, a name that's simple, full of hope. Her parents were two modest souls when they imposed upon their teacher babe a name that has the faintest taint of maiden, teacher, worthiness. Audrey, destined to make headlines, although she lived with Parakeet and taught the rhythm in Shakespeare's beat. Two gutless gunmen, soul soured up, their brains burnt down to charcoal heap by crack greed, fear, illiteracy, who knew not Shakespeare from a boombox beat. Their dull selves blinkered in darkest ooze that God, once destined to be a brain, enough bolts there to fire a gun between the two foul gangster slugs. The innocent Audrey's car slid by, her head still singing out the sounds that Shakespeare spake four centuries past, the words that pour sweet unguents on, the wounded souls that need his balm. She heard within her solitary life the violence of the Yankee world. 
yet wish to pour into the dragon's maw, into the festering and stinking jaws, into the rabid hellhole of the Bronx, essence of tranquility and love, were I a glove upon that hand that I might touch that cheek. The bullets crashed into her skull and bones, turned Audrey Chasen into mincemeat. So Audrey is now wired up, pulse weak, thoughts scattered by the bullet's whine that ricocheted around her head, so full of midsummer night's dream. I know a bank where the wild thyme grows, the steel chews up and tears the flesh, where ox lips and the nodding violet blows. Blood spurts, veins rip like telephone lines, shattered by the tempest rage. There sleeps Titania some time of the night. The crossfire of a gunfight was her fate. To be or not to be, more the readiness is all. Who will feed the parakeet, she quests. Dear Audrey, lying in her bower, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. So that was about Audrey Chaser. <laughs> I did Salome in New York. Eventually I worked there at the Brooklyn Academy. It was very exciting. We were there for a week. We sold out. So, Good experience. And we did Salome there. We got a wonderful theater, the Brooklyn Academy in Brooklyn. It was still started up many years ago, and Peter Brook rearranged the theater, so it was a fantastic, like a great uh, auditorium on one level. <coughs> and um, curiously enough, Al Pacino had done Salome the year before. In New York, it was a big flop. <laughs> I didn't mind <laughs> because uh, I was meant to, to be doing it, but I couldn't. Uh, we, we had a dif disagreement, and he found somebody else, and, and they did it very badly. So I was glad to do it. So I'm in New York, 1995. New York, October 95. The driver said to me, where to? I slid behind the dirty shield, the perspex wall between man and me, in case crack starved, I pull a piece and spread his brains upon the seat. So now my criminal lust is caved behind his battered carapace. I read the posters on the screen which state my rights. I'm not to tip unless I'm fully satisfied the driver's done his best and been polite. Taking me by the route I like, I slump back in my grimy seat, bandaged up with insulating tape, like the cab's been wounded slashed and raped. New York is held together by a million miles of this grey tape. Without it, it would fall apart and crumble in the filthy lake. It seals the rents inside my room, where the air-conditioned unit smashed the hole into the hotel wall. The tape fills in the gaping cracks. The filthy cab lurches and bumps like a ship on stormy seas, we bounce along the calloused face of Manhattan, scarred up streets. I read my rights, stare at his head, tear down Broadway to Brooklyn Bridge. He's seen the sight a million times. I turn, and it's a wonderland. The city hits the water's edge. It stands quite still and blinks a bit, like deciding what to do, whether to try and make the leap. We hear the bandaged city shriek from time to time, like some poor beast as yet another knife is thrust into its bleeding, rotting flanks. We head down Brooklyn to Carb Avenue, a name which seems to suit the place. A hairdresser was killed last night while riding in his cooped up cab. Two gunmen forced his cab open like opening a can of beans and shot to death the man inside who read his rights upon the screen and decided not to tip unless the ride was satisfactory. In the car, he tipped his blood over the cabman's bandaged seats. I stop, get out, and kill some time, and go where the slaughtered beasts end up between two slabs of rye, a pile of pickles on your plate, Junior's Palace of Delicatessen, Museum of the Ancient Tongue. I sit upon 
unbandaged seats. The menu is a mile long. The Talmud, the kosher world. Aromas seep into my world. I'm swallowed in the ghost of Ma, smiling as her wolfish son wolfs down her golden fried fish cakes. So now I order chicken soup with giant mousable within. I slurp the soup. The memory is right. Divide a sandwich, though it's huge. A corned beef mountain sheared in two. One half I donate to my friend. My tongue begins the steep ascent. My teeth tear footholds in their flesh. Ah, alas, too much. I tumble down and divide my half once again. But now, after I've crunched the pickles and fed my guts, now feed my eyes. The clientele is mostly black who come in every shape and size. Big and small, huge and white, old and young, and mums with babes. They love the Jews for just one thing, a giant slab that's called cheesecake. <laughs> well satisfied, we walked the streets to warm up. Before we hit the stage, we entered a buckled metal door, the rectum to the empty space where actors enter to prepare a face to meet the faces that they meet in the theatre's belly. We will stew. But this time, we're the delicatess. The high-priced punters get to eat. Tiny room becomes my cell. A lonely time, the makeup's cool. It's 40 minutes before I go on. Those 40 minutes feel like hell. My purgatory until I face a thousand judges in the dark, ready to sentence me to death, or else bravo me into space. We enter the arena stage and spin our tale of pain, decapitation, lust and death in slow motion and stately pace. I say my final line, my heart is high. From 2,000 hands, it rained applause and bravos, shattered the Brooklyn skies at last. New York was salamized. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's just a couple more here. Then as I got used to it, <coughs> somehow you had the moment after the euphoria, uh, the fantastic kind of excitement, the thrill, the newness, the exploration, the adventure, the fantasy, and then after a few weeks, you start to hate it. Because <laughs> I've gone to LA, it's wonderful, brilliant, fascinating, exciting, absolutely everything, until there comes a moment when you wake up and you see this brown layer of smog. It's thick. There's a huge brown stinking layer of carbon monoxide. And suddenly people don't speak to you as nicely as they used to. And suddenly people are indifferent. And everybody's so kind of full of themselves. And everybody's so full of their noise. And you can't enter a restaurant without sh people shouting about everything and screaming about everything they do and been and want and heard. Where in London people don't shout in restaurants. They go to restaurants after the theater, or after a movie. And they discuss what they've seen. They open the program and say, oh, wasn't Vanessa Redgrave wonderful in the second act? <laughs> <coughs> oh, Simon Russell, but it was so superb, this King Lear. But they, they don't have any theater, really, except little, little equity waiver theaters. So the restaurant doesn't become the after act in the theater. It becomes the theater. So when they're in the restaurant, they think they're on the stage. And suddenly that's a play. And they're all acting. And it drives you insane. <coughs> There's the play. Suddenly I'm disillusioned. If the smog doesn't get you in its grip with its deadly carbon monoxide mix, then AIDS will wait until you're ripe, then chew your corpuscles with deadly bite. We'll get you. In the end, no fear. We'll hurl a billion cancer cells, gift wrapped in a million chemicals to make the food you eat look swell. Oh, you avoid the junk and read the text. No colors, no preservative. You eat organic, no meat, no fat. You drink wheat grass and meditate. We'll get you yet. We'll cut you down. <laughs> Radiation is still around. How many nuclear bombs were shit by the arsehole in the White House, John? 
while you eat your bran and figs and jark in the polluted fumes and fuck now with transparent tubes and suck each day your vitamins and do aerobics till you faint and get a waistline like a wasp, eat fibre to make turd-like cigars and carrot juice to make you fart. A huger explosion now takes place beneath the desert way down deep. Atomic fusion tears apart the earth while you soundly sleep. The earth shudders, groans and aches. It's live, organic, gives sweet air. Its juices feed our bones and sap. Mr. President drops his pants and craps. Just like a dog digs in the earth to cover up his smelly shit and leaves, at least the soil will drain the best. But what's it doing with Reagan's filth? I'll tell you, want to know, old boy? It creeps into the broken rock. What seeks a way will find a way. A little rainfall finds a crack. The water travels through like blood. Like blood will join the arteries. The arteries, the nerves and veins. One day you'll wake up with a pain. Oh, sorry, there's a shadow on your x-ray. Oh, God. I don't smoke, drink or screw. Don't eat meat. Buy health foods. Meditate. Do yoga, too. I'm sorry, but you have Medicare. Yeah, sure. What can I do? Please tell. I'll do anything. What regime to make my body sweet and clean? Phase doesn't get you, fleeing man. And plants a serpent in your brain and radiation just misses your house, like God passing over the Israelite slaves and carbon chemicals, DDT, deadly fish from polluted streams, giant industries killing bees, and acid rain that skins the trees. We'll get you. We'll get you. We will. We'll arm an army of discontents. Brains blasted by bullets on TV. Wealth, sex, power that he never sees. Sex in the city. Gimme, gimme, gimme. I want it, want it all. How to be rich, be rich, make more. How to make money, make money, make it. There's only shame in being poor. Oh, you can't be too thin or too rich. Look at your cousin in Bangladesh. Is she too thin? Is he too rich? Ah, oh, don't tell me, let me guess. We'll use your greed and hate. We'll make you our new Frankenstein. Programmed by junk heroes on the screen. His new commandments. Give me, give me. One day, you'll come awake in pain. A microbe stole inside your vaults. The safe wherein you stored your seed. It loves to attack you in your balls. I'll buy a gun. It's easy here when you can buy just anything. Dollars sanctify the act of selling guns to lunatics. I'll get you, boy. One night alone. I'll break inside your home, sweet home. I'll kill you dead. Hate rules me, boy. Mothers, daughters, children fly. Hate, rape, attack, assault. Stab, shoot, burn, smash. Armed response, guard dogs, guards can't stop me when I'm having fun. I'm a microbe of self-destruct. It happens when you hurt the earth. Hurt people, then life will react. It seeks to destroy the ugly fat. Oh, ban the bomb. OK, OK, it's just a symbol of the malaise. It's only a link in the deadly chain of self-interest. We'll do it my way. Then ban the gun and ban the greed. Ban the need to spend your bucks by sticking your profits up your nose. Each snort will feed ten empty guts. Then ban next the garbage TV that unloads on the collective head. The message is a deadly word to describe the sewers. Deadly turds. It flickers day and night. Death ray cells to penetrate inside your cells to make your brain a catacomb and there the rats will incubate. We'll get you in the end. We'll get you in the end. Don't run. There's no escape. No credit cards. We'll help you when you drop the bomb to preserve Disneyland and Dynasty. <laughs> then I went through a period of discontent. <laughs> Got a bit. <laughs> But then, like everything else in America, you come back a year or two later, you fall in love with it all over again, <coughs> which you can't help it, because it's so full of amazing and wondrous and unexpected things. And I like sometimes being alone, maybe writing in a cafe. You can't do that very easily in England, because they have these little chairs and tables, and people always want you to move and carry on and let the other customers come in. But there, they have diners where they expect you to stay forever. <laughs> I mean, they expect you to sleep there because they're open 24 hours a day. And they have banquet seats. So you have these beautiful banquet seats facing your banquet seats. So you don't see the people there. You don't, they don't see you. And you sit and you're at home. And it's a wonderful sanctuary. 
Then somebody showed me, I was in Los Angeles now, and they showed me a delicatessen. It was called Cantor's. And that's up in, uh, in a place called Fairfax. And it's been there about nearly 100 years. And it never closes. 24 hours. It's on. So wherever you are in the world, you know it's there. So you can be anywhere. You can be in somewhere like, as I was a few months ago, in Leeds or Manchester. And you're miserable, but then you think, Cantus. <laughs> <laughs> and your mind travels. You can leave. I can get this out-of-body experience, which was taught to me by Yuri Geller. <laughs> and he said that if you, said Stephen, if you concentrate, you can actually place yourself there. <laughs> so I'm in this place in Leeds. We went to this cafe, and they had, don't really like to communicate too much. So Ron said, "Can I help you? What can I do for you?" They said, "You're right." They <laughs> said, "You're right." I, th I don't know why they said, "You're right. yes, I'm fine." So I projected to Cantus. And my mind went through the air, and suddenly I'm in, in, yes, I'm in Fairfax Avenue. I go through the doors, and there's all the counters with all the, the various cakes they have, and knishes, and all the wonderful bagels, and black bagels, and white bagels, and sourdough bagels, and onion bagels, and this one and that one. You only have like one type here, but all these. And I got in, and I see the waitress. I step into my spirit. So whenever I get too depressed, I think of Cantor's. <laughs> so I ate in Cantor's delicatessen, where pickles leap into your eye, and beef is sliced up to the sky, 24 hours a day in rye. The broken dolls of waitresses whose fluffy blonde hair tops a face that's weathered miles of pounding feet beneath the aging carapace dressed in white, the uniform for delis dealing in dead meat. Meat that's salted, stewed or fried, barbecued but piled mile high. Meat sliced fine on steel machines, meat wobbling on trolley steam, meat that's gorged, chewed, swallowed whole, glued in mustard, pickles and dough. The fat, obese, obscene crawl in the temple of the overweight, the altar where you purge the sin of hunger and stuff till you faint. Oh, Bangladesh, oh, Ethiop, oh, Delhi, Calcutta, Sudan, oh, baby's arms, thin as the ropes that stop the diners pouring in, oh, swollen stomach filled with air, oh, eyes clawing the empty air, oh, hands grabbing, snatching on air, oh, God, where, uh, someone out there, oh, let's make a pop song, or tune. Let's pour some love and dollars too, then we'll buy some grain and fuel, and then sleep well in Malibu. Corn beef on rye, pastrami locks of Rubens, cheese melting on top, the beef sliding over the edge, torn out entrails called sweetbreads, heart, lung, livers, kidney too, balls and brain, a witch's stew, throw in a toad or hangman's grease. Hey, I'll have that on sourdough, please. 24 hours. With daily churns, could fill half of Africa with what it puts between two buns. Now open wide and down it slurps. Oh, precious canters, holy Delhi. Not Delhi, India, home of saints, but Delhi, home of gefilte fish. <laughs> Fat matzo balls and stomach aches. The paradox, don't question it. The TV brings you starving babes, watch Dynasty or dried up tits. That starving mouths will suck in vain. The TV brings into your home the suffering of the human race. If you could now reverse the tube and send corned beef on rye through space. Who are we to feel some guilt? We worked, we paid our taxes, rates, we paid for our trailer home that we use on sunny days. Did Jesus say, listen, my brethren, it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than a rich man to go for heaven? Oh, you want heaven? No, of course not. You don't believe in all that shit. I pay my taxes, keep the state religions for the old and kids. What will you do with all your wealth? Invest it, man, in outer space. Since there's no God out there, state could claim before the race. Did Jesus say, give up your wealth? Hey, I pay my taxes and my rates. Yeah, but when I die, I must confess, 
I ate far too much <clears throat> delicatess. <laughs> then, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> of course, couldn't go without a, a, just a little comment on the movie I did. First movie. When I went out there, I was doing a little play in a kind of what they call equity waiver. That means you waive your rights, you waive your salary, you waive anything you have, you waive your union, you waive everything you exist, you waive your, your conscience, you waive... <laughs> That's called Equity Waiver. <laughs> so I did a play in Equity Waiver, Santa Monica Boulevard. And by chance, uh, Martin Brest was looking for uh, uh, that guy to play opposite Eddie Murphy, Billy Hill Scott. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, at that time, Sylvester Stallone was actually the guy I met. He was the man who was doing it. And um, you know, I had to meet him. I met the director, a very charming man called Martin Brest. He says, Steve, I'd like you to meet now Sly. That's very nice. Then I went to another room, and there was Sly. He was sitting behind a desk, and there were about 12 people, because there was him, and of course his assistant, and his assistant's assistant, and then the producers. And then they have many producers. They have producers and associate producers, and over-producers and under-producers, <laughs> and connecting producers, and then casting people, assistant cast, and they had these 12 people. And I was sitting there before these 12 people. And so it was a little bit strange. <coughs> I wasn't intimidated because I was so fascinated. And, uh, you know, apparently Martin Brest said I was the right person for this particular role. I wanted a kind of a cold blooded Englishman. Stallone said, You know, it's a very, um, you know, very, uh, <laughs> you know, very, very, uh, you know, I, hate, I liked, uh, you know, I liked the, Eng I liked the British actors. I said, oh, thank you, thank you so much. I almost want to say Sly, but it sounds a bit odd to say Sly. Didn't know him. Thank you so much, Mr. Sly. Oh, yeah, do you know they have the, the voices? You know that, that when you hit the English act, they have the great voices. They can really project voices. You know what I mean? I don't know how you do that, but you got the fantastic. <laughs> so I tried to make a little joke. <laughs> I said, well, how they get those voices is because of the pubs. They close at 11. So when the actors finish at the theatre, often they finish, they don't come down till 10, 10.30 and they get the makeup off, and so they rush into the pub and say, another pint, please! <laughs> <laughs> and they have to have voices to get a, a bloody drink. <coughs> Is it? That's a good story, do you? <laughs> <coughs> so then, I got along with him, I've done a very charming man, and easy to work with. But that was the second film. I didn't work with him in this because he left the film because he didn't get what he wanted in terms of the uh, uh, action, the sets. He wanted to close down the freeway for a piece of action and producers say, no, we can't close this freeway. It costs a million dollars an hour to close the freeway. We can. So he left. <laughs> so then they had nobody for the film. So they asked everybody. The film was all cast and they had all the locations and they had the costumes. Everything was made. They couldn't cancel it. So they, they approached everybody, you know, all the kind of actors that you think of, Ryan O'Neill, all these people, they all were busy. And the thing is about this guy, Stallone was playing this uh, cop, and, um, and he has an affair with a woman in the art gallery, and they have an old, she's an old flame, Well, they couldn't do that because now it's a black guy, Eddie Murphy, so they had to change it. And um, so he had to... Uh, take over the dialogue, but the dialogue, of course, was written for Sylvester Stallone, so it was all this tough guy dialogue. <laughs> but he was a comedian, so he changed everything. And so you had to be prepared. So that was exciting, because he made up stuff as he went along. <laughs> and that made the film the most successful of all the Beverly Hills Cop films, and the others couldn't follow it because they were all scripted. Trying to copy, but you couldn't copy the brilliance and genius of Eddie Murphy's improvisational skills. So I'm just waiting. Waiting, waiting, waiting around. The sun pours down and drifts away. The shadows lengthen on the ground and eat into another day. Okay, let's go. The figures move. Ready. 
A voice calls from the gloom. A clapper snaps. The cameras roll on action. Actors <coughs> clear their throats. Quiet, please. Rehearsal. Someone yells. It all goes quiet. Just the birds who sing and twitter in the hills and pine trees release their summer smells. A stuntman sits and talks of feats to a fellow crony and just nods. You know, fights are not what they used to be. Not when you had the Duke and Steve. Duke, of course, refers to John Wayne. Steve, of course, is Steve McQueen. Now both dead. This used to be Buck Siegel's house. The walled surround, the pool on top, the tiled fountain and terracotta, the view that makes you gasp out. Wow! Wow! What a place! The valley spreads beneath your eyes, a paradise. The Hollywood sign sits up high, so all the world will raise its eyes. The sunburnt valleys green and mauve. The cypress trees indent the hills. The mansions stand remote alone beneath. Hollywood freeway spills. Then, in the blinking, waning sun, the sky is bluish red and scarlet pink. The dry gorse glows as evening comes, and lizards slink within the weeds. Action, he calls! And raise your gun. A Magnum 60, the model says. Now smile just as you use your thumb to cock the trigger's deadly sea. Just smile and raise your arm real slow. Oh, is this okay? The actor pleads. He checks the image in the hole where dollars manufactured dreams. Oh, great, it looks great, he says. The blast boom, echoes through the house. I raise the gun after the blaze, just like the way it was advised. This was my first. This was my first, my Hollywood. The first time I invaded time to place myself within the wood where Holly is a white-teethed smile. My suit's prepared, my tie is slick, I raise the gun again, real sly. My first exposure on the print, a gun against an empty sky. This is how you view the world. You grab a bacon bagel first, the sun sweeps down and wipes your neck. You wait until your name is heard. Okay, action, no talking please. This is the shot, his POV. The body in the bathroom bleeds. The flies invade the lemon trees. The scene today is your death fall. Your shirt is rigged with sacks of blood that will, on action, spout their gore while you pretend poof, the bullets thud. The star is introduced to you. He surfaces from out his cave, the giant trailer where he plays his tapes and keeps from public gaze. Hi, how's it going? Is the code the handshake and the teeth exposed. He stubs your face out in his head the moment you have turned the bend. The sun sinks down while our L.A.'s rise. The jeweled crown now spikes the sky. The cameraman says, two more shots before the light begins to die. It's over now. The field explodes. The cars are dying to get back home. It's called a wrap. My debut done, I fire a really heavy gun. Then I just finish with this. this thank you. <laughs> Thanks. OK, for the last, the last one is uh, just to finish off. Could go on all night. <laughs> Lovely to be working again. <laughs> don't work much these days but next to my hotel in Los Angeles it was a motel it was like a kind of no frills motel called the Marinas Pacific Hotel it was a lovely hotel on the beach next door was this place they have all over LA called Tom's it's like a burger joint but really cheap and mostly down and outs go in there but they never tried to upmarket it and improve it or paint it. It's just down and out place. And you get the kind of people you'd never see ever in England. Because they're down and outs, but with a poetic tinge. Here the down and outs are just down and out. And they're drunk and they're dirty and they're, 
a bit sad, but there they're kind of they're artists, and they're always playing music or doing funny things, and you know, saying, and they never have like here the down and outs. You know the down and outs. Oh, they do all like that. There, the down and outs have these great voices. They have fantastic voices, and they can speak, and they don't, they don't have any funny accents. So I'm even fascinated by the down and outs. The faces stare out meekly from Tom's gloom, slurp down their breakfast to their tunes, clutching their tin cassette decks like a bride that will no never them deny. We'll play the sweet sounds yet just once again. They hold them like a dear sweet friend. The smell wafts up like from the dead. Turn now forward, face the sea, not back, not back inside the L.A. scene, where broken backs of houses stake their claims, don't dare to park, don't trespass, hints of pain. Turn now to face the crispy, light blue sky. Let the joy of life pour in your eye. Run, run, pound feet and thigh. The sand and quiet early new dawn day is yet so unpolluted like a flower, not yet picked, not exposed or claimed, not yet trodden on or stained, just calmly taken like a morning stroll, heart pounding, and the day pours into you, the sun and sky and air a whole. But then, like everything else, there's always a time when you think, well, I'd better go home. You don't know why. What am I going home for? But you think, well, maybe it's a good thing to do gather up, you know, loose ends, yeah, but the flat and the old lady there. And so you think. Now the forlorn gathering up. I bought a little car there and I thought, well, to sell the car or not, to sell or not. No, let it stay while you go back to earth. Let it be waiting for your swift return. You tie up all the ends and view the world. This is the place that you did once unfurl. This was your home on this earth's plot. You cut and dug and sent Shoots bursting through. You ripped the clay and in it dipped your toe. You pierced the fruit of the USA tree. You said, want part of you, be part of me. You needed to uproot your ancient past. You pulled the roots, white knuckled oh so fast, and then decided, oh no, I may be home at last. <laughs> What made you such a sinner in your thrust? What curse put boomerangs in wanderlust? What makes us say when time is time? What? Have you drunk enough the wine? What? Merely sipped the nectar of the gods? What? Rushing back to save familiar sod? What makes you turn again, you worm? Yes, it's true. The blood boils, the eye can see. Yes, the heart whimpers for you and thee. Yes, the sun's bright, the face is strong. Yes, the new world breaks our old song. Yes, cut the umbilical cord to Mother Earth. Yes, free yourself, arise in your rebirth. Yes, quivering new, the soul at last breaks through. Don't live once more to say, if only I. Don't ever do nothing and then say, why? Don't let a dream slip by and let it fade. Don't let your arms hang dumbly like dead weights. Don't fail to grab it with both hungry hands. Don't fail to notice the celestial plan. Don't dream it, shit. Go for it, man! That's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you.